So before we get into the actual instruction and the tying procedure, um, I'd like to give you a short, a brief history about the, uh, the, the soft tackle fly. The soft tackle fly probably goes back a hundred or more years, but it was fly fishers like Sylvester Neems and later Dave Hughes, to mention a few of the several who have made the soft tackle fly very popular in recent years. Neems wrote his first book in 1975, and in that book he gives credit to T.E. Pritz, who published a book in 1886 entitled North Country Flies. Neems also gives credits to Richard Bauer in 1747 and others who followed. So as you can see from this brief history, the soft hackle and its origin goes back not only decades, but centuries. I'd like to, before do, saying any more, give you uh, a, a view of what a classic soft tackle fly would be. And this is from George Socher. This fly was tied in 1800. But the flies that we'll tie tonight are typical of some of those of Neems. And the method that we will use will be, in part, the way that I tie it, having learned from another fly tire in Pennsylvania, as well as from Dave Hughes' book entitled Soft Hackles, Winged and Wingless Flies, Wets and Fuzzy Nymphs. The components and the manner in which these are applied in a soft hackle fly make it much more lifelike than the stoic, classic wet fly patterns. I'm showing here the light K hill that we tied last month. And as you might notice, it is very traditional in terms of its features, but it's not very lifelike in the water. In other words, the components do not move with the current. In contrast, these three soft hackle patterns Having the hackle being able to move subtly with just the current itself induces a lifelike characteristic in these flies as they're being fished in a stream or even in still water as it's being moved by the fly fisher through tightening the line. So why are we learning to tie another representation of an immature mayfly or a caddis fly. If we did one last month, why are we doing a different one this month? Well, for several reasons. First of all, to advance your tying skills in several aspects. You'll be using metallic wire to segment and reinforce the abdomen of the partridge and hurl. You'll be using peacock, which is a very important and common component of many fly patterns, which has an iridescent green color uh, in the water, uh, which seems to be very attractive to the fish. You'll be learning the application of a full hackled collar, whereas with the light K hill, it was just a partial collar. And you'll be using a dubbing bump to accentuate the movement of the hackle collar. I showed just a minute ago the movement of the soft hackle fly as compared to the uh, traditional wet fly and it's that hackle collar in combination with the dubbing bump that allows it to pulsate in the water as it's being retrieved by the fly fisher. I'll go back to my illustration before and give you some examples of three different soft tackle patterns that are that can be tied using the, basically the same method that we're learning tonight. The second fly here is a partridge in yellow. The one in the middle next to it is a partridge and hurl. And the one on 
the far left is a partridge in green. I will also include or have included with your tying materials materials so that if you want, you can tie a partridge in orange. These are at least four of Neem's patterns, but they're not Neem's original patterns. It was his adaptation of the fly from someone else who tied it earlier. <clears throat> the first fly that we're going to tie today is going to be the partridge in yellow. Again, this is one of Sylvester Neem's flies. However, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, many of Neem's patterns were adapted from earlier fly tires. But I like to give him the credit because, frankly, I have several of his books and uh, a video. And uh, so he is one of my favorite uh, fly tires um, that I had looked to when I learned to tie the soft tackle fly. So in your package, you will have a size 10 uh, wet fly, a wet fly nymph hook, you will, which I'm going to insert in the vise right now. And you will also have um, several partridge flank feathers. And so, Though they seem very small and they are delicate, um, you will shortly realize why we use this type of feather for a soft tackle fly. And the third component that we are going to be um, using is a piece of dubbing. And this one I chose is a hairline green damsel which will go very, very nicely with the body of this fly. And the last component is some of this silk, which you should also have in your package that will represent the abdomen of the fly. So I'm going to start <clears throat> the tying of this fly, and I'm going to go through this step by step and uh, try to point out the uh, sort of the intricacies or some of the subtleties um, of tying a soft tackle fly. So I'm going to start the thread um, just slightly behind the eye of the hook in the typical way that we start thread on, on a hook. And I'm going to wrap it back about halfway along the shank. And I'm going to stop at that point <clears throat> briefly, clip off the excess thread, and then take a sec section of this yellow silk. And it's my understanding that the reason that silk was used for the body of these flies was because silk has that iridescent quality that it's, it's also fine and it, and it has that iridescence which probably the, makes it easy for the fish to see. And it most closely resembles that of an immature insect such as a mayfly. This particular light um, light colored or yellow soft hackle fly probably best represents um, a fly that would be hatching in May, early in the year, much like the light Cahill was. And as you saw me tie that in, and I'll be glad to do that again, I'm simply laying one end of the silk on top of the hook capturing it with my tying thread and then wrapping the thread forward. And then I'm going to begin to wrap the hackle, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the uh, silk thread around the shank of the hook, coming back and to a point just immediately above the point of the hook, and that is the, the, the very tip of the point. And I'm going to go back to that point and then wrap forward. So each of these wraps will be very close to adjacent to one another. Now I'm just about at that stopping point here. And now I begin to wrap forward. This fly has a very narrow abdomen, as do typical mayflies um, and caddisflies when they are in that form where they're beginning to rise to the surface to hatch into a mature adult. 
I come to a point just about where I have left the thread hanging, and then I'm going to use my tying thread to capture that silk fiber at that point. Make one more wrap on the back, the rear side of that piece of silk, and then make one or two wraps in front. That anchors the silk in place, and I can now cut that off. This represents then the abdomen of the fly. The next thing that we're going to learn to do today is to, to make a dubbing ball. And I'll explain as I go through what this dubbing ball represents and what it does. First of all, it represents the beginning of the thorax of the fly. But mechanically, what it represents is sort of a, a, um, a bumper, as you might find in a parking lot that keeps the car from going forward. The same thing here, it keeps the hackle from folding back too far on the abdomen. So I'm going to take a very small amount, less than, it, it will occupy less than maybe a half inch of my thread. And this is not extremely fine dubbing, but it, uh, it is a little more coarse than what we would use for dry flies. I will show you the package that uh, I'm pulling the dubbing from that um, you will receive. It is this hairline dubbing, and this is Green Damsel. I chose this because I feel this most closely resembles the yellow silk that we used. And now I'm going to wrap this in just one place, immediately in front of that silk. And as you can see, I'm creating a small ball of dubbing at that point. And I think I have just the right amount. So I moved my thread slightly towards the eye of the hook, let it hang in place. In fact, I think I will um, probably wrap it to the eye before I go to the next step. What I have chosen here is one partridge hackle fiber. And of course, like most feathers, you have a sort of a dubbing type of uh, portion of the feather that's closest to where the feather enters the skin of the bird. We want to strip that away on both sides. It's not needed. And then we want to turn the feather over and make sure that these fibers are approximately the same length as the shank of the hook. And this one is. I then grab the very tip of the feather and I stroke all of the other fibers back. So now these fibers that I'm going to use can be checked again in terms of their length. We would like these fibers to be approximately the same length as from the eye of the hook back to about where the point or the barb of the hook is, and this one is. I next take this feather and I lay it with this tip just right underneath the hook at this point and I bring my tying thread around, which catches that tip and makes it secure. I'm then wrapping the thread forward towards the eye over this portion of the hackle fiber, which is sticking forward, and I'm going to clip that off. It's no longer necessary. I leave my thread hanging right where it is and I grasp the butt end of this hackle fiber with my hackle pliers. And I urge you to use hackle pliers and do not use sharp hackle pliers because they will cut through this relatively thin uh, barbule. And it's almost impossible to do it by holding them between your fingers. So please use your hackle pliers as you do this. Notice now the next step that I do. 
I will be making one and a half turns with this hackle fiber, hackle feather, and I will be stroking back the fibers as I make this turn. It's good to moisten your hand a little bit, and as you begin to come around, just pull those fibers back, make one more wrap, Again, stroking the fibers back. And then stopping at about that position. So I've made one and a half to maybe two turns. And now I'm holding the hackle fiber up with my hackle pliers and I'm coming in between the part that is wrapped around the shank and the part that I'm still holding through the hackle pliers. I'm wrapping that thread through there, about two turns, and then two turns in front. And then I'm holding this up so I don't cut my thread accidentally. clipping off this excess. Now, we have a few strays here, so we're gonna clip those off. And then I'm going to hold this back with my left hand, and then just wrap immediately in front to finish the head of the fly. And we just wanna build that up so that it's a nice silhouette. And then I will use my whip finisher to finish off the fly. And there we are. I'll trim off the thread. And we have a completed soft tackle. And this would be Neem's Partridge in Yellow. Okay, the next fly that we're going to tie is going to be the partridge and hurl. And the hurl is referring to the peacock curl, which will be the abdomen of the fly. And also part of the abdomen of the fly will be segmentation with a relatively fine copper wire. I'll be using the same hooks that uh, I used for the first fly. And these are a size 10 nymph and wet fly uh, hook. Uh, these are made by the Sabre company, or at least marketed by, by Sabre, and they're pretty much characteristic of most of the other brands, like Mustad and Dairiki and Daiichi. Um, and again, this is a relatively, uh, I think this is a um, 1X long, and uh, it is a size 10. Um, I've chosen size 10 because I think it's going to be a little bit easier for you to tie with than a 12 or a 14. However, uh, many of these soft tackle patterns are going to be more effective in the size range that, uh, that they most closely mimic um, the actual insect itself. So I would suggest that after you get proficient at tying the fly in a size 10, then you advance to a 12 or a 14. And that's generally a good rule of thumb whenever you're learning to tie a new fly pattern. Um, that uh, start off with a larger hook, tie several of them until you get the technique down, and then begin to make smaller versions of it. That will come in handy when you're on the stream and you find out that the fly that's actually hatching is somewhat smaller than what you originally thought. And if you have the fly in three different sizes, then you'll be able to go down in terms of the size uh, and find that it's going to be more effective. And that's also a general uh, good rule of thumb, that if the fish are not hitting your, let's say your size uh, 12 fly, uh, try a 14. And if that doesn't work, try a 16. And if that doesn't work, then you should 
start rethinking what pattern you want to use. But um, I try to carry at least uh, two or three different sizes of each fly in my fly box for those occasions. Okay, so I have uh, already pinched down the barb on the hook and I'm going to insert it in the vise in the standard way. And this time I am using some ultra thread. This is 140. Um, this is probably equivalent to what we would normally call our 6X uh, thread. Again, I'm going to start it immediately behind the eye of the hook. And I'm going, I'm going to wrap about halfway back the shank of the hook. At that point, I'm going to tie in a piece of wire, a copper wire. And notice what I'm doing. I am tying this wire in on the side of the hook closest to the camera. That would be the far side from me, the tire. And so I'm anchoring it there so that when I begin to wrap this wire a little bit later on, it's going to be starting from the opposite side of the hook from where you are, the tire. So I'm wrapping this back a little bit further back than we did for the first fly. The first fly we stopped the thread and started the abdomen immediately at the tip. This time we're going to tie, or we're going to start the, the abdomen or fly a little bit further, closer to where the barb of the hook is, is sticking up. If I were tying another type of wet fly that, it, that involved a tail, and I'll be talking at the end of the presentation about the flimp, which is basically a coined word that means a combination of a fly, a wet fly, and a nymph. I could tie in at this point that tail. So that would be the only difference in the construction of a flimp versus a soft tackle fly. Now that I've tied that copper wire in, I'm going to um, bring my thread back about mid shank and stop at that point. And then I'm going to select two peacock hurls. And I put these together so that the fine tip of the two fibers are at the same point. And I clip that off just to make sure that it's even. The butt section, which is of course the part that is sticking into the bird itself or into the feather itself, will be towards the rear. And I'm going to be tying these two fibers in, starting at mid shank, and tying them in at that tip that I created in the hurl. I wrap the thread back till I get to the point immediately above, to the place immediately above the, the barb of the hook. And then I bring the thread forward, wrapping it forward and stopping about three quarters of the way or approximately maybe a quarter of an inch behind the eye. Then I take these two fibers and I wrap them around the shank of the hook. Going forward with each wrap. I always like using peacock. I use it in many flies. Even if I'm tying a terrestrial that's made out of um, some sort of a, uh, a uh, sponge type of material or rubber type of material. The first thing I'll do before I tie on that rubber type of material or that, that spongy material is I'll, I'll build up an abdomen using peacock because when a fish is looking up at that fly, it sees the iridescence of the peacock and uh, it makes it look more realistic as if it's the abdomen of this insect. Now that I have the hurl wrapped up nearly oh, two thirds of the way forward, I'm going to secure that with several wraps of thread, in this case two. And then I change hands and make two more wraps in front. 
and then I can clip off that extra hurl and put it aside. And now I'm going to use this copper wire in two aspects. One is it gives a segmentation and the other it reinforces that peacock which tends to be very fragile especially when a, a, a toothy type fish would bite into it. So this is reinforcing it and it's segmenting. I'm wrapping this wire also contrary or con uh, in the opposite direction counterclockwise looking from the head of the fly as I did the peacock. We traditionally wrap all of our materials in a clockwise fashion but when we're segmenting a fly or reinforcing it with wire or something else um, to provide that reinforcement we wrap it counterclockwise therefore it tends to be more prominent and not inter intermersed amongst the uh, the barbules of the of the hackle or the dubbing if dubbing were being used so i'm just counter wrapping this wire forward until i get to the point where my thread is and then i secure that with two thread wraps at that point behind the wire and then two wraps in front of the wire and then i clip this off now Many people will, or many tires will, you'll, you'll see them take their, their tying scissors and they'll clip that off. That's the worst thing to do if you really have spent some money. Uh, not that these are expensive, but I, I keep them sharp and only cut threads and other light materials. Now I could cut it off with a coarse pair of, um, of scissors, but we can also do a procedure called helicoptering where you basically use your, your uh, small pliers or something else like that and basically rotate it several times and it will eventually break at that point. Except in this case it's a little bit more tedious. There we go. So you get a nice neat um, cutting off point and you don't have that piece of wire sticking up. The next step that I'm going to take is going to be making that dubbing ball. And in this particular case, <clears throat> I chose olive, and this is Nature Blends from Umqua uh, Dubbing, and you will be receiving some of this material to use for your dubbing ball. Okay, using the same technique that I used for the first fly, I'm going to take off a few fibers in my right hand, and I twist them on, and if you recall from when we learned to uh, tie the light Cahill, you always your, twist your dubbing on in one direction. You don't go back and forth. You just twist it on the thread in one direction. And so I have this tight noodle that's about maybe three quarters or an inch long. I have that in place. I slide that up the thread and I wrap it in just one place so that you create a ball right at the, the front of the fly. And next thing I do is I have selected a, a feather for this. Again, this is a partridge flank feather. And I'm going to strip off some of that loosed uh, feather dubbing that's at the, at the base of the feather. And then I measure the length of these fibers, and they are approximately the length of the shank of the hook. I grab the feather by the tip, pull most of the fibers to the rear, leaving just that tip exposed. And now, if you notice, and I probably didn't mention this clearly before, when you're holding this feather, and ready to apply it to the hook. The concave side of the feather should be facing the hook, not the convex type. So it's going to be this way. Then you hold the tip of that immediately underneath the shank of the hook at the front. Make a gentle wrap around to secure that and then wrap your thread forward. It can now cut off this excess on the top. 
make one or two more wraps, and then begin to wrap the hackle forward. I again grasp the butt of the feather with my hackle pliers and begin to make several turns. The first turn is going to be immediately in front of that dubbing ball and I stroke back the fibers just gently wetting my finger. I make another turn Slightly in front of the first. I bring that the hackle up. And then I wrap my thread immediately between the part that's around the shank of the hook and the part that I'm holding up in the air with my hackle pliers. I make two wraps there. And then switch hands putting a hackle plier in my left hand and the thread in my right, make two wraps there, and then I can clip off this feather. Then by holding the fibers all back with my fingers, I make several wraps to build up a head and finish, it, finish off this fly. After I've made several wraps free like that, I'm going to take my hackle pliers, I mean, I'm sorry, my half inch tool and make several wraps with that to finish off the fly. And then just clip the thread and we're finished. There's one fiber here that I don't particularly like. Get rid of that guy. And there we have a peacock and hurl. Another one of Sylvester Neem's patterns, but as I've said already several times, probably pre-existed uh, Neem's. But this is a very effective fly, particularly this time in the spring uh, when some of the insects are still dark in color as well as the partridge in yellow, which will be very, very prevalent as we move into to May and summer. Thank you. Okay, before we uh, go, go towards the end of this session, <clears throat> I would like you to uh, see several of the, of the patterns, uh, the, the soft tackle patterns that I tied uh, deliberately to illustrate what would be a, uh, a good tie and uh, a not so good tie, so to speak. And so um, I'm going to critique my own three flies that I have here. The first one I'm going to point to is the, uh, the partridge in hurl. And when I look at this fly, um, yes, it is a soft tackle fly and it's tied in the, in the typical method that I have already described. But when I have left out or have minimized the dubbing ball that's located just underneath this uh, hackle wing, if you want to call it that, or hackle fibers, um, you see that, that the dubbing ball did not sufficiently hold the hackle up at an angle that's going to allow it to, to pulsate very much in, in the current. So doing my own critique, I find that this is less than satisfactory. The length of the fibers are fine, but I'm not satisfied that I put enough of a dubbing ball there. You don't want that dubbing ball to be so much that the, that the uh, fibers are actually standing up 90 degrees to the shank. They should be um, probably 45 degrees off of the shank. In this particular case, in this partridge in, in yellow, um, I have tied the, the feather in uh, a hackle feather in, and it's a little bit too sparse. And so it really does not have many fibers, that, and they are also not quite long enough. So these are a little bit too short, and I didn't make enough uh, rotations of the hackle around the shank of the hook. In this particular case, which is be another partridge and hurl, 
you can see what happens when you choose a, f a feather that is a little too long. It basically looks like a bad hair day and the fibers are, are much too long and they're not going to, to give that nice shape that you would see in one of the others that I had a little bit earlier. Uh, for example, in this partridge in, in yellow, where I have the fibers about the right length, the dubbing ball is, is just almost perfectly executed and the fibers actually create sort of a halo effect around the fly, which is in the current, as I mentioned before, is gonna pulsate very nicely. So I thought it would be good to, to show everybody um, what I would call a well-tied well fly versus some that have, that need a little bit of improvement. So I'm offering this as your own, uh, your own critique and uh, it's always good to critique our own flies, but don't over critique them because otherwise it's not going to be fun. Okay, well, <clears throat> I thought before we finished up today, I would uh, talk about some other variations of materials that you could use if you do not have on hand um, some of the, the materials that uh, were used in tonight's tying. And so, um, I'm going to uh, show you some, some other substitutes for the uh, partridge feathers. Um, one of them would be uh, woodcock feathers, which again are small and uh, work very nicely uh, for the hackle collar, or guinea hen feathers. And many of these you can get at um, uh, art stores. Uh, they come packaged in, in these small packages and there's plenty of material there. Uh, another option would be grouse feathers uh, for some people that uh, might have some grouse feathers in their, um, in their tying materials. Or if last but not least, um, what we would refer to as hen hackle. And as you can see on this uh, hackle skin, the feathers down at the bottom are just the, about the right size to be used for a hackle collar. On a, on a soft tackle fly. So uh, this is just to sort of open up your imagination so that you can begin to experiment with different materials that achieve the same uh, effect. The other thing I wanted to mention was ways in which you can sort of dress up or slightly modify your soft tackle fly. Um, the gold ribbed hares ear is a, is a very popular um, fly, not only in the nymph form, but also in a soft tackle form. And it's basically tied in the same uh, steps that I used tonight, in which you have gold wire instead of um, copper wire uh, ribbing the fly, and you have hares ear dubbing um, in place of the uh, um, all of dubbing that I used in, in tonight's fly. You can accentuate um, the fly, the, the soft tackle, a little bit by putting a small gold bead uh, immediately uh, next to the eye of the hook in the front, which is going to add a little bit of weight and add a little bit of sparkle, that, which might uh, attract the, uh, the fish more to the fly. You can tie in a tail using something like wood duck feathers and create a flimp rather than a soft tackle. And also think outside the box in terms of where and what types of fish you would use a soft tackle uh, fly for. Um, don't limit your, your imagination just to trout fishing. Um, try it with bluegills or crappie or even smallmouth bass um, in small ponds uh, that might have a perch or, or other types of, uh, of small uh, fish that will make for a, uh, a very interesting day on a, in a hot summer when trout aren't biting but the bluegills and the smallmouth bass are. And how to fish it? You can fish a, a soft tackle fly either as a single fly off of a strike indicator or without a strike indicator. Um, you can fish it along with a nymph, using the nymph as the dropper, and the soft tackle as your lead fly, or in fact, you could fish the soft tackle as the dropper off of another dry fly 
which would be your indicator fly. And lastly, uh, in terms of what uh, dimension or what size um, leader to use in fishing a soft tackle, um, probably a 4X would be the good uh, uh, dimension for the, the tippet uh, portion of your fly line. And uh, certainly using a, uh, um, a full floating line with a 7.5 or 9 foot leader would be ideal. Uh, when fishing a soft tackle fly. So I hope that this evening's instruction and some of my comments have been informative and wish you the best if you, uh, um, as you go forward in tying soft tackle flies and uh, using your imagination, that's what fly tying is all about and enjoy yourselves. And if you have any questions, be sure to give us a call. Thank you.